When I was nine years old, November 2nd, 1962, I was a very sickly child. So I was home watching television while I had, God knows what, the flu or whatever. I watched the assassination of John Kennedy live. That was so devastating. He was my hero. And to see him assassinated live is very important to me. So what my work is about is the devastation and the change and the alterings and what I try to do is make it as an abstract image that shows my life. So this is a sculptor Reps. He had a lovely truck and he would pull up, put in to the street, his sculpture, but this is all cut steel and welded. And this is graffiti as stable, and you can't move it. But my graffiti was ephemeral. It could be up for three months or three days. So Rev Studio, you're right now in Dumbo. So this is my inspiration. Why do you like it so much? Um, it's not about like, it's about taking your creative inspiration and making it not a part of the establishment. It's about, it's on the street. I don't need a gallery, I don't need a museum, I don't need a shop. We just put it on the street and it's for everybody to see. It's not discriminatory. It is for everybody. This is democracy right here. Steve West. Uh, welcome to my loft. I moved into the loft in uh, 1991. Uh, there was approximately 10 of us in the building. So my basic process is I do lithography and this is uh, my printing press. Charles Brand, 1958. Um, the great part about this printing press is it was produced on 84 East 10th Street, New York, New York, which if you look out the window, you can see 10th Street from here. So the process I use is called Pronto Plate Printing, which is a plastic sheet. Um, in this process, this is a photo process, so I take images on my phone. So as you saw the walkthrough yesterday, when I come upon um, something that has kind of a special meaning to me, I will image it on my phone. From there, I take it to Lightroom, and from Lightroom, I go into Photoshop. And then through Photoshop, I can create CYMK files. So there's four plates. Cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. So therefore, I have to print it four times. So therefore, these little holes, if you see on the page are the registration marks so you take a pin 
that goes through the plate and then the paper. So therefore they all line up and create this colored image. In this image that you're looking at, if you remember from yesterday that there was a sculpture that was attached to this rock by Revs. Someone took a sledgehammer, broke the stone, cut the bolts, and stole the sculpture. And here's some of the remains. So that gave me the reason and motivation to create those images. Uh, I came to New York in 1981 uh, started out as a performance artist. And as a performance artist, uh, I made no money, absolutely <laughs> none. Um, and I worked with the Franklin Furnace. Uh, so then I went into another process of graffiti art. So that is, I would make silkscreen images and poster the streets. Um, that was in the early 90s. Yes, they're up there. And once again, I chose a process that made absolutely no money. I had a show at, um, in Bushwick. So when I parked the Jeep, um, I parked in front of this tree. This is the American Elm that has grown through the fence. And so the fence is embedded in the tree. Um, I grew up in Midland, Michigan and I was born 1953. In the early 60s, the Dutch Elm disease killed all the American Elms in my hometown. New York City has the largest stand, remaining stand of the American Elm. So therefore, there was a connection between my childhood and this tree that refused to be fenced in and it would grow through. So it had a very special meaning to me as this is kind of my hopeful image that no matter what, nature is going to still take over. Um, I had a visit from a curator uh, from the Museum of Modern Art. And she recommended that I tack the prints to the wall. It takes me approximately 10 hours to make one print. I'm not pinning it to the wall. Uh, Kathleen and I went to see Peggy Guggenheim, Art at It, which is a documentary on Pe Peggy Guggenheim. In 1942, she opened her gallery in New York, Art of the Century. Frederick Kessler was the designer of her gallery. He created the walls out of plywood versus the white walls that you see in most galleries. So therefore, I came up with the idea of creating a panel that would be an installation um, format. So what I do is I screw these to the wall and where the screws go into the wall, the magnets attach the piece. So that was my um, solution to having the paper so that you see the registration, registration marks, thumbprint, the whole process. Can you show us the original framed ones? Don't you have one over there that you could show how, they, how you were showing them? Okay, so very traditional. Yes. So because the curator visited, you were inspired between that and the documentary to really switch up the format, which now is really an integral part of the piece. 
it's an, it's an entire uh, environment. Now, as a part of that environment, she also recommended that I create a book. So, working with the poet Bob Holman, he would send me poems. What's Bob's? Tell us a little bit about Bob. Bob is a, I met Bob 25 years ago. He worked with what was called the Tribe Magazine, Steve Cannon. And a part of the Tribe Magazine, um, there was called the Stoop. And a part of the Stoop would be poets would gather around a table, read their poetry, and then they, Steve and Bob Holman would give critiques of the poems. Was this the actual stoop in the East Village, I believe? Yes. It started out at a stoop in the East Village. East Third Street. Okay, so this was an interactive collective sort of thing. Right, it'd be like what we're doing now as a studio visit, and then there would be critiques about the work, as I'm saying that, um, Sarah Suzuki, the curator of, at MoMA, at MoMA, was giving me a critique on how she wanted to see the display. So rather than the original frame thing, based on that, you were inspired to develop this very beautiful sort of installation technique. Right. Um, and Bob Holman is a pretty famous poet, I believe. Yes. Uh, He's also a professor at Columbia University. Right. Um, and so anyway, Bob and I have worked together for many years. So rather than creating a book that just sits on a table, I took men's dress white shirts and silk screened the poems onto the shirt. And then... Why men's dress white shirts? Um, one, it's white as a page. Two, I also think it kind of represents power and how that white shirt is used in a corporate setting. And I like the idea of altering the setting from a corporate setting to the page as art. So kind of like the man, like people work for the businessman. Yeah. Um, so, and then I hang these uh, shirts onto this stick. Now the interesting story about the stick is I used to work for a gallery called Leo Castelli in the 1984-85. Super one of the most famous galleries during the heyday of the Soho art period. Right, the, you know, the artists were Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol, uh, Robert Rauschenberg. So I was installing the exhibition for Jasper Johns and there was a painting called Dancers on a Plane, and it was coming in from Basel. So that meant as the young, <laughs> youngest on, I had to stay at the gallery in the evening to wait for the international crepe. Seven o'clock in the evening, Jasper Johns shows up, and it's just me and Jasper. So, for three hours, we just talked about his art and art, which was fabulous. There was one painting called In the Studio. And I was confused about one part in that mostly I got it. It was an appropriation of a Picasso, which was also called In the Studio. But he was using his own studio and I got that but there was a stick that he had attached to the painting, which came off the painting. Um, and I, I didn't understand that. Um, which is important to my art 
process, a program, in that I asked him, and then he went silent. You asked him why he used the stick, right? right. What was the meaning of the stick? And, and, and he got quiet. He got very quiet. And I said, well, if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to talk about it. He says, no, I'm just thinking about it. Which to me is, I always thought Jasper Johns made sketches, drawings, knew what every movement within the painting before he even made it. So here I am, young man, talking to what I believe is the American master, and he just thought, the painting was flat and he needed to add a stick. And he was thinking about it at that time. Um, so it, it was more about the improv and not having to think that the, having in your mind that the piece is completed before it's completed. And that's one of the great things about the Pronto Press Pronto plate lithography is the plate breaks down as you're printing and it allows me not to make a perfect print and accept it and accept that idea of the imperfection within my need to be perfect. Um, so this is my appropriation of Jasper John's stick. So this was a very key subliminal souvenir for you, where this is a, a very important memory from many years ago when you were a young, you know, gallery, gallery assistant, etc. And you had this spontaneous conversation with a very famous artist. And you had an idea that everything was pre planned to the T and you discovered that it's actually a very spontaneous process. And that has stayed with you throughout your entire art career. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to summarize. So in saying that, um, can you tell us a little bit about the shirts and what's on the shirts and your process of the shirts? Well, you mean the physical process? The physical process of the shirts because it's quite laborious. Yes, I have to take the shirt apart, take the cuffs off, take the collar, take the sleeves. And then silk screen it. And then I have it sewn back together. Which I do not do. <laughs> I tried and sewing is, is way too difficult for me. <laughs> so how does your past inform your work today and what you like and what you dislike. How is that, how do you feel like that was formed um, from your past? I went to Eastern Michigan University, 1972 to 76. There was an artist, Vito Conzi, who gave a lecture he was a video artist in the 60s and 70s. As a young student watching this 90 minute video, I did not have a clue as to what was going on. It was so far beyond what I'd ever seen uh, growing up painting puppies and sunflowers with my mom, but after the 90 minutes, uh, Vito came out and spoke about his work. And what altered and changed my vision was how does the individual create a statement that can be universally uh, be a collective? So that has always been a part of my process that um, when I look at and find an image, I create what I feel is an abstract painting, even though it's 
in real time. And I alter it. And that's how I feel my influence of the past has created the future. Is there anything in your past that you um, have a particular memory of that makes certain things abhor abhorrent to you, like that you absolutely don't like because you have sort of a visceral memory of certain things? Well, what comes to mind and I think it goes to the beginning of my uh, talking about performance art, uh, graffiti art, is as a child, I would take the chlorine bottles that mom used for cleaning, because dad always wore white shirts, so it had to be bleached. Aha, uh -huh, there's the white shirt thing again. Well, <laughs> there we, there we so go. So therefore, I would decorate them, um, put feet on them, and turn them into piggy banks. And it was just for my fun. Mom decided she wanted to sell them. And that, that kind of created the whole idea of not selling my artwork. Um, even though today, as a, as a memory, but that that's kind of. I hope that answers your question. So there's a negative association, you know, associated with sell, selling your artwork. It's like you wanted to do it just for fun, and your mother wanted to turn it into a commercial enterprise, and that was just a turnoff. I'm going to guess it made you probably not even want to make them anymore. No, I didn't. The, so you just stopped. Yeah, I stopped making them. Okay, classic. And of course, now at 66, I would love to sell my artwork. Right, but now it's your artwork and you deciding to sell it and right. not someone else, you know, being sort of pushing you to do something that doesn't inherently feel right from yes. your sort of artistic um, integrity right. and, perspective. And for me, just the whole idea of making the piece is more important, but obviously I show, I've had um, quite a few exhibitions. Um, and the point is eventually you wanna, you know, the point is you wanna sell pieces, but the more important part of it for you is, is actually the process. Oh, absolutely. It's like absolutely. A, a labor of love and a sort of a, sharing of a, a re revelation of your soul in a way, yes? It's an attempt to find the soul. And it's that struggle um, that I enjoy going through that journey.